Hello, and uh, welcome again to our looking at the scripture readings for this coming Sunday, which is the third Sunday of Advent. Uh, the old Latin phrase used to call it Gaudete Sunday because it uh, served as the technically the middle Sunday of the Advent season. The readings are from the uh, prophet Isaiah, first reading, first reading, chapter 61, verses 1 through 2, and then they skip to verses 10 through 11. Second reading comes from Paul's letter, first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. And the gospel comes from that of John, and uh, the readings are from chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, and then verses uh, 19 through 28. Now, um, probably do things a little bit uh, differently uh, today, although what we're basically concerned with in these uh, uh, talks is to look at the uh, text of the scripture itself. Now, I mentioned earlier on that the guide through the year, this year, is Mark. But Mark being a very short gospel compared to the others causes a problem when you try to figure out how to get enough readings for, um, well, 34 Sundays in the, uh, of ordinary time and then filling in the um, special seasons of Advent, Christmas, Lent, and Easter. So the substitute to our kind of help flesh out the lack of enough readings from uh, Mark is to use the gospel tradition of John. That also helps to explain a little bit <clears throat> why John doesn't get a year of his own. Remember that we have Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We have the three uh, years, but John doesn't get a specific one. Well, there are a number of reasons for that, but one of them is that he helps fill in where we need some readings uh, that would enable us to kind of move forward with regard to the liturgical year. And so all of that is to say that this week, the third a week of Advent in the Markin cycle, takes the Gospel of John. Now, the Gospel of John is, of course, very different in a number of ways as you remember from this, what we call the synoptic traditions, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In fact, in the Gospel of John, which is also absent from Mark's uh, Gospel, there are no beginning stories about Jesus' life. Where, And we will look at this uh, in the next couple weeks where in Mark and Matthew, rather Matthew and uh, Luke, there are some uh, stories which help us to celebrate the Christmas season. So all of this is to say that the Gospel of John begins um, long ago and far away. It, it, and it opens the Gospel with what is known as a prologue, the first 18 verses of John's Gospel. Very beautiful, often quoted, frequently used in a liturgy before the time that most of you are watching, but uh, before the changes that took place in the 60s, there used to be, when the Mass was restructured as we celebrate it today, there used to be uh, two Gospels. There was the regular Gospel, which was at the Gospel time that we have now, and then there was always what was called the last Gospel. And the last Gospel was always the same, and it was always prayed by the priest with his back uh, to the community, and it would be on the opposite side of the uh, altar. And that last gospel was the, what's called the Prologue of John. And so it was used very, very regularly in the old liturgy. Now, it is really used not at all frequently. Well, uh, if you pay attention, if you're alert, you will see that on uh, Christmas, there actually are four suggested readings, one for the vigil, one for the night, one for the dawn, and one for the day. Now, the gospel reading for the day, you guessed it, is the prologue of John. 
But that really is the only time now in the liturgy throughout the uh, three cycles uh, that that particular uh, passage from John's Gospel is used. Now I mention all of this because uh, the Gospel today picks up a section of the prologue. Now we really won't have much opportunity to talk about this prologue. It it's, contains most of the themes that are part of the Johannine Gospel. And um, so in that sense, it does what a prologue should do. Remember, if you're writing um, a book or you uh, maybe have a prologue, the prologue should actually, if you're writing a book, should be written last because it summarizes what you are doing in the work. Most students, when they did term papers in that, started with the prologue and then went on to write their paper. And if you looked at the prologue and what they wrote in the paper, you would notice significant differences and you'd wonder how the prologue really worked at all. But in this gospel, that's the case. And there's much discussion among scholars about just when this was written and what its purpose was. Some think that it was not originally written for the gospel and uh, was a poem that kind of set by itself, although today it does fit very beautifully into the, um, into the gospel. Now, I, I mention all of this because the prologue can be divided into three parts. The first part would be uh, verses one through um, five, the second part are verses six to eight, and then the third part are verses nine through 18. Now, why do I mention this? Because it's the second part that the gospel begins with this week. Now, the whole prologue, you remember, very beautiful, and perhaps most, many of you have heard it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then, um, and this prologue, if one wants to get its roots, and this is why there are a number of aspects to consider about John, is that he often is very uh, attentive to the Hebrew Bible, to the Old Testament. And the opening words, in the beginning, now if you're very attentive, you will say, isn't that the way the Bible begins? In the book of Genesis, yes it does, in the beginning. And so much of the thinking of the prologue is drawn from the Hebrew Bible. And in the beginning, what did God do? Create. And so what does this prologue say? In, this, in the beginning, God is about to create something um, very important. And I, I brought along the text just because uh, of, of its importance. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the word was God. Now, of course, there's a lot of discussion about noticing that the word was God in English would indicate that there's a divineness about the word, but that the Father is not the same as the word. So there is a distinction here. And that, of course, is what we call a Christological issue. And there is much reflection and discussion about that. It continues, he, that is the word, was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him nothing came to be. So notice that there's a, and this is a characteristic of the John 9 Gospel, it's all, very often about relationships. What relationships do folks, people have with one another, but the most important and most intimate of relationships in the Johannine tradition is the Word's relationship with God or Jesus' relationship with the Father. So that is the most intimate, so intimate that later on we see the similarity being sameness in terms of divinity. So again, kind of, that's a conclusion that will take a number of centuries of Christian reflection to happen. Now, all of this, I'm not going to read all of it, comes to the section for this week. And here's what it says. A man named John 
was sent from God. He came for testimony to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. Now, those are the opening words from the uh, prologue that are brought to our attention today. What, what do we learn? Well, we learn that there is a man named John. Who is this John? Now, in this gospel, and we will hear in a couple minutes, all kinds of things are said about John that he claims do not belong to his role or to his mission. As I mentioned uh, in our last talk, keep in mind when you're reading a particular gospel that you don't know about the other three because what we tend to do is amalgamate uh, information that we have and thus create a composite uh, picture for our own. And that's what we also do with the Baptist. But in this case, by the way, we'll see in a moment, he is not called the Baptist. He baptizes, but that doesn't mean that he has the title of Baptist. But what is the role? And this is interesting. And as I say, today we're just really looking a little bit at background information about the fourth gospel. The role of John, which is pretty much what many throughout this gospel are called to do, is to be witnesses to the word. And in this case, the word being Jesus. And there, as the prologue concludes in verses 17 and 18, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. How many Christmas cards have you seen with that on? Okay, so that, of course, is uh, very important. But that's the closest, by the way, that John comes to any kind of incarnation, what we would call incarnation story. But John is to give testimony to whom? To the word. One of the titles given to the word is that he is light. A light, and this is a powerful image again within the prologue, a light that shines within the darkness, and the darkness is never able to grasp it or, or take it over. The light will always shine on in the darkness. Now, this becomes an important theme throughout the Christmas season when we will frequently use image of light in connected with connection with Jesus and uh, his mission. So, what do we learn about John? Well, now we skip um, to verses 19 and uh, 28. And again, I just to read these so that you can, we can kind of reflect a little bit. I know that you do it on your own, but uh, nevertheless. Now, this is the testimony of John. See, this is the importance that John is a witness. And what do witnesses do? Give testimony. Uh, so there's a kind of legality to it. And he's the first witness throughout this gospel. In fact, as we move through it, we will have some opportunity to see some sections from it. That is consistently what different figures who appear in this gospel do. They are witnesses or give testimony to Jesus, to what he is doing, to who he is. When Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, who are you? He admitted and did not deny it, but he admitted, I am not the Christ, the Messiah. Well, they push him. Then who are you? Are you Elijah? I am not. Are you a prophet? No. So they said to him, well, Give us an answer so we can respond to those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? And he responds, and here now, of course, Isaiah is again used. I am the voice of one crying out in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. So the John 9 gospel writer quotes again Isaiah, and I've pointed out a few times this is the most frequently cited prophet New Testament writers use. Now, some Pharisees also were sent out. Now, 
I may mention this before, but we stop a moment to, to point out that this gospel needs to be carefully understood when the term Jews is used, because a misuse of this term throughout the centuries has caused a great deal of harm to the members of the community of Judaism or the faith of Israel. Jews here is a specific term used by this gospel writer alone. Now the others also use the terms, but not in the same sense that this is used. In fact, 60 times in this gospel, the term Jews is used. And what the concern is that it seems to suggest everybody, the Jews, see, the community of, of Israel. Now, in fact, if one puts into perspective here the Joanine situation, that John is baptizing where? By the Jordan near Bethany. Now, uh, John frequently mentions historical sites. This is uh, kind of something that we've noticed. For a long time, we thought that the real historical information was given by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But a more careful examination, it would seem that the Joanine writer, it more accurately in terms of some historical incidences and places, is actually more correct. Now, that's just an aside. We don't often place a lot of em emphasis on that. But these little uh, gems of historicity that this gospel leaves for us are interesting for those who kind of would like to put together a little bit the historical situation of Jesus and his, and his time. So John is a baptizer, but the Jews, now who are the Jews? Well, the first you notice that it is the priest and the Levites. By the time that this gospel is written, you may remember that this gospel, in terms of being authored, is late in the first century, the usual time that the gospel was written, sometime between the year 90 and as much as 120 into New Testament, into rather second century time. The most frequently accepted period would be sometime in the 90s. So you think about it, it's a gospel that is written some, well, 60, 70 years after Jesus' time. So that also is uh, something to consider. But what I wanted to just mention here is the term Jews. The Jews here would be referring not to Judaism, not to the whole religion of Israel, but to a specific group of leaders, and maybe that's important to notice, it's not the Jewish community, but it's Jewish leaders, and even John is careful here in um, presenting them. Priests and Levites, Levites had similar roles, you remember, in terms of worship. When the temple stood, so the suggestion is that the temple still stands if there are priests and Levites, and then a little bit later in the text, the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees had little or nothing to do with what went on in Jerusalem and worship. They were teachers, they were rabbis. But when the gospel is written, the Pharisees have gained a position in Jewish life because by the time that this gospel is written, the temple had been destroyed Levites and priests had lost their job. The leaders of the Jewish community tended to be members of the Pharisee group. And here's where the tension is. The tension is between these leaders and those Jews who have accepted Jesus. So in a certain way, this is a tension between members of the Hebrew community. Those who belong to the, what we would call later on the rabbinical Jewish community and those Jews who belong to the community that later becomes 
so-called Christians. But the fundamental uh, tradition in which all of them belong is Judaism. That's why the Gospel of John makes many, many allusions to the Old Testament because the assumption is that everybody who is reading and listening to this gospel understands Judaism, see? So what, what, what will happen is, as centuries move on and we miss this, then there's a very different understanding uh, about why the Jews go after the, uh, Jesus. Because Jesus' group represents a position in Judaism that is opposed to the other group and vice versa. So you really get a sense, by the way, that the Jonine gospel would like to convert or bring into the fold the other Jewish communities. And there is a real attention there. Another kind of thought that is just an aside and means to spend a lot of time in this, but it, because it's one of the few times that we're going to have John for a while, the sense of arguing, by the way, uh, you know, nobody likes people who argue. We always try to avoid arguing. But there is a way in which arguing can be helpful for learning. And that perhaps is something that we missed. Uh, Christian scholars or studiers of the scripture like to re reach a consensus. Let's see if we can all kind of agree. Even if we disagree, we can do it in a, a pleasant way. In Hebrew thinking, the way in which you learn is I would say, you know, two and two make four. And then the responder would say, yeah, but maybe there are occasions when this isn't true. Let me show you. See, so that a discussion would break out. And out of that discussion, the, th the theory is, comes new knowledge, new learning. That this kind of arguing is not antagonistic in the sense of I ought to get somebody, but it's uh, how do I get, how do we get out of the text, out of the discussion that we're having, a better sense, a better knowledge of things. And that also works in this gospel. And that's something, again, we keep in mind. So the, the issue is, however, <clears throat> to go back to where I got into this, the Jews. Well, I think many <clears throat> hearing that do not go through all of this little discussion that I have, but merely think of the Jewish community and they're all responsible for it being antagonistic to Jesus. See, and that's what we need to be very careful about. Some suggest that maybe we shouldn't use the term Jews anymore. So some authors would say, let's change the term to Judeans. And more specifically, the Judeans were members of the Jewish community who lived in the South, that is in Judea. Or let's call them the Jewish leaders. These were not all the Jewish community, but very specific persons within the uh, tradition. Others say, but the texts say. So here we come to the, to the literalist. Texts say the Jews, and that's what we're going to keep. And that's fine, except for all of the reasons that I just gave. It, it really gives an erroneous understanding of Judaism to the ordinary hearing of that. You just hear it, and some of them don't even pay attention to it. But notice the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, see, and, and that's uh, problematic here. So uh, back to this text. So we're in, uh, for Sunday, we're introduced to the, the Baptist, okay, who tells you all the things that he is not, okay? But his primary role is to testify, to witness to the word made flesh, to and that's why he says, I'm not the light. But who is the light? The light is the word who comes into the darkness. And as we pointed out, texts then say, a light that the darkness is not able to extinguish. And again, many Christmas cards kind of play on that theme. So there are powerful themes here in this prologue that do uh, kind of come to the light as we are uh, celebrating or getting ready to rather to celebrate uh, Christmas. The view of this gospel, some say, is a prolonged trial 
about the person and nature of Jesus. So you see, I mentioned this a couple of minutes ago, all these different witnesses to Jesus, and then culminates in this gospel with the passion narrative. But John, therefore, is pictured here as being the first witness, and uh, he is a very, very powerful to this. Um, well, there's much more uh, to say on the, the whole John 9 gospel, but I, I did want to take the opportunity this morning or today to kind of uh, remind us of that. I'm sure you've heard it before, but uh, it's perhaps important to, to keep that in mind. Now, one other thing, as the opening of this gospel begins, uh, he presents it as a grand week. Uh, and so the gospel that we have just, uh, we're hearing this week, begins with day one. We are introduced to John and what his role is. Day two, Jesus uh, walks by and uh, John says, oh, here is the Lamb of God. Notice very interesting titles given to Jesus in this gospel. Uh, I didn't know him, but now I know him. And um, so whoever the, the group is that are standing around, uh, he noticed, uh, and this is another thing that a witness does, something that your parents, my parents, told me never to do, point. Now, uh, but uh, what in this gospel, many of the witnesses, I would say, are pointers. To whom? To Jesus. Here, pay attention. He's the one. Listen, learn, uh, look, see. Um, so that's day two. Day three, Jesus passes by again, and John has two disciples with him. And um, he says to the disciples, here's the Lamb of God. Why don't you go uh, check him out? And um, they do. That's another story that will be coming up. I think we already mentioned that. Day four, Jesus leaves now and calls um, a, a man named uh, Philip and Nathaniel to... Um, uh, kind of learn about Jesus. And then, so there's four days, and then it says, after three days, now one, four, and three give you seven, finds Jesus at Cana of Galilee where he will perform uh, the first sign. So nicely that leads to that. All right, this is just uh, today I've been an in, uh, introduction uh, a bit to uh, how the Gospel writer John introduces John, and they're not the same person, by the way. One of the difficulties in the New Testament is there are too many Johns, or many different Johns. And uh, so this is not John the evangelist, but John the, the witness. The, um, finally, in conclusion, the first uh, reading comes from Isaiah. We've mentioned this before. This week, it's Isaiah 61. This is the third Isaiah. Remember last time? pointed out that there are three different Isaiahs. Um, and this would have been written shortly after the Israelite people were released from captivity. They're now back in the land of promise. And the words that uh, are used here by the prophet is, we are now going to find God working to create um, around Zion, which is the hill of Jerusalem is built on, or the hill of uh, the, the mountain of God, we are, God is going to with the, help us build a beautiful new garden, newness, beginning, uh, a new vision, a new advent, a new time. So in that sense, uh, this is appropriately used. And finally, uh, the reading from Thessalonians um, is used because of the opening words, rejoice, rejoice. See, and so that comes to what I began with saying that this Sunday is the middle Sunday, the Sunday of rejoicing. Some of those of you, uh, we uh, even change a little bit the color of the uh, vestments from purple to a rose, um, but uh, because we're looking forward to a new dawn and a new time. Well, Thank you very much, and uh, have fun with John.